on Sunday 24th of October, me and a few folks from across the south part of the North Island of New Zealand went to this place in Raumati, which uh, a gentleman by the name of David Otter had managed to hire out this hall. And this is um, most of us anyway, uh, captured at the time. And we had a lovely day having a look at all sorts of collections of retro machines. What was great about this particular gathering is that all of the owners of these particular machines got to demonstrate and tell a little story about how they got their machines as well as a background on the machine themselves. Like for example, this one, you can see the massive, like almost like lead shielding on the Atari 800. This is the Atari XEGS and this is the MB Vectrex, one of these sorts of machines which I'd never seen in the flesh before. It was really interesting to see vector graphics from a 1982 machine. And I was even more surprised as to see how to get colour on these machines. This is how you get colour. There were some more familiar looking faces like this Apple II GS, which there was plenty of people playing lots of games on. This one was brought by my friend Jacob. It's the IBM PC 5155. He had also got a really cool looking Commodore 64 in a transparent case and he runs a company called Monotech PCs which makes lots of printed circuit boards and plug-in replacements for older machines. He brought along a number of prototypes that he's working on for his new projects which were really cool to see whilst they were in the, in the works as it were. This here is a prototype for a GoTex, so a USB drive controller that would work in things like an Osborne computer. Here's a Nuxt, the machine that's been featured on YouTube channels a number of times. This is the new XT motherboard. I was also quite taken by this ZX Spectrum Next. It's the old Next, yeah. The old one, it's the new one, because the Next Next is on its way. Next. This is an X next. It's the same now, isn't it? So, I think the, the firmware is the same and the um, NEPCA is the same, but they just bumped up with the hyper and the fabric. This Backplane Pro also quite took my fancy. It's kind of like an S100 system. It's a demonstration of this coming up as well, running CPM. Here's a bunch of the original Commodore systems, and here's a few S100 style bus systems. 1978 and 1981, or the university trainer. So that's, is that like a Chem 1 sort of thing? Uh, similar, yes. Right. Yeah, except that's the Motorola 6800. Right. Yeah, that's a 6800, and then that was a 6809. So these, these aren't S100 bus, are they? Um, the S, yeah, S100, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or SS50. Look at these! Look at the size of them. Yeah. Have you had have you had tested any of these? Or are they? I, I used to use that one, but then I went to another machine. So, um, when was the last time you had these running then, or this one? They, these two, probably twenty years ago. Oh yeah. So that um, last week. Yeah. So this one's um, 6800 as well, is it? What's that? This is 6800 as well, is it? Yes. Did yeah. you did you build this one yourself? Uh, no, I actually got this second hand, but that was my first computer in oh. 1983. And as you can see, it's an electronic kit set. Yeah. Oh, 79, yeah. That's so cool. That's really, really cool. But uh, the original is one car of um, RAM and one car of ROM. And so, like, there's no like ASCII text no. sort of thing. It's just like this. Yeah, and basically, that's that's as big as the numbers that you're going to type. And and is this a Australia? Australia. Yes. So is this an Australian machine? Yeah. Cool. And so, did it did it did it actually have a name? Yeah. It's just a dream. Sixty eight hundred. Yeah. That's as that's as much as a screen as you got. <laughs> that's the resolution there. Yeah. Here's a picture of the ET3400, which is a system that helps you understand 
the concepts behind computers. So they're all very basic systems. Next, I went over to visit one of my favorite machines on display this day, Terry's Lisa, the Apple Lisa is a fantastic system. And if you stay around to the end of this video, Terry has the Lisa opened up and shows you how easy they were to service. A wonderful machine for people to service. Totally different, of course, to the modern day servicing of Apple equipment. But back in those days of the era of the Apple IIe and the, um, the Apple III even and the Apple Lisa, very, very easy to maintain machines, very serviceable, lovely machines. So have a look at that um, at the end of this video, as well as some sort of use showing how the, uh, the operating system is actually used. So, so many great machines, including this TRS-80 Model 4, which I actually liked a lot more than what I thought I would do. Um, there was the um, Commodore Amiga A1200 in this particular case, a wonderfully set up system with all mod cons added on. And this very exotic IBM PC GX, it's the Japanese IBM PC Junior system, which was then sent off to Australia um, and New Zealand markets. So a really interesting system, which looked pretty cool in its sort of gunmetal gray color as well. Thought I'd just take a moment here before I go on to the demonstrations from all of the owners to say if you like these videos, uh, then check out the rest of my channel, Al's Geek Lab. And of course, press the subscribe button. And if you can, press the thumbs up. Uh, pressing the thumbs up does two things. One, it's good for me because I know that you're interested in the content that I'm making. But it also means that you can get more related content from me and also other channels which do similar stuff. Finally, I'd just like to say that you can join in even more of the stuff by visiting me either here uh, on YouTube under the YouTube membership feature or on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab. In either case, you get exclusive access to early content such as this and you also get extra behind the scenes features as well as a whole lot more. So do check that out. It's at patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab or here on YouTube by clicking on the join button. And without further ado, here are the talks. Uh, so Apple had come out with their Apple II. Uh, they were thinking about uh, going a bit further. The Apple III was on the horizon, but um, they also wanted something new and quite innovative. And so uh, Steve Jobs had a team working on something like that. And he happened to visit the, um, uh, the uh, now it was the um, uh, Xerox. Xerox, yep. Xerox Laboratory, 1979. Uh, and they showed him what they were doing. And uh, I know they showed him three things. He only remembers the first one, or at least he was so struck by the first one that he sort of ignored most of the others. And that first one was they showed him a uh, graphical user interface powered by a mouse, and he just thought that was incredible. And so he came back and he thought, we've got to design something like this, and uh, the Lisa was the result. Now, Steve Jobs, being the sort of guy he was, uh, got offside with a lot of the developers that were actually working on the Lisa, and he moved into looking at the Macintosh. Uh, but the Lisa finally arrived in 1983, and uh, it's it was one of the first computers that had this graphical interface uh, driven by a mouse. Uh, one of the first ones that were actually, could actually be sold to individual users. Xerox had their own, but they sort of sold them en masse to companies, a system. Uh, so it was quite innovative and quite groundbreaking. Um, lasted for about three years, and of course the Macintosh replaced it. It was one of the problems with the uh, the Lisa was that it was so damn expensive. And when it first came out, 10,000 US dollars. I think in New Zealand here, it was, the ones that did appear were about $20,000. Huge amount of money. And uh, was really never a commercial success. And I've heard some people refer to it as uh, the Edsel of uh, you know, the computing world. If any of you are familiar with vintage cars, you know, the Edsel was one, it was well designed, and but never actually went anywhere. It was a commercial failure. And uh, figures I've seen say that about 100,000 Apple leases were sold, which wasn't many when you think about it. 
Um, it's a beautiful machine, and, and uh, when I first uh, acquired this one, um, I'll talk about how I acquired it uh, in just a moment. I was really struck with the the uh, software that came with it. You know, the Apple uh, Lisa Office Suite uh, is really very, very innovative and uh, uses a, a very uh, object-oriented approach. So on the screen here, um, rather than getting applications, you've got a piece of paper, like ones uh, if you want to write something. Uh, ones if you want to do some calculations. And what you do is essentially you create a document, like tearing off a piece of paper, click on that document, and then you get the application coming up. Right? You can just write on it. Um, so I was really impressed. Uh, how I got about acquiring this one, I actually managed to get three all at once. None of them were working. <laughs> and uh, so I got these three leases, and from the three of them I managed to cobble together two working leases, right? Uh, they came in three bottles of leases. The first one, uh, the Lisa 1, uh, had uh, what they call the Twiggy drives, which were five and a quarter dry inch drives. Not standard five and a quarter inch drives, but unusual ones. Uh, and they were known as the Lisa 1s. Now these drives were quite unreliable, and uh, they pretty quickly went to the standard Sony um, Three and a half inch drive, okay, 400k. And um, they call that the Lisa 2, right? There were two versions of the Lisa 2. The Lisa 2 5, which uh, looked like this, except it came with a profile hard drive. These are hard drives that also used with the Apple 3. And the profile drive sort of sat like a hand, right, on top of the, uh, the Lisa 2. And they were the Lisa 2 5, because it was 5 megabytes for the hard drive. Then they had another one uh, called the Lisa 210, which is what this was. And rather than having a profile drive, external drive, it had what they called a widget hard drive built in here, right, set here. Uh, now, uh, this hasn't got a hard drive. This is actually using a, uh, a more modern card substitute, uh, which uses a CF you know, flash card uh, to run the hard drive. and. Uh, the board in there called the profile, the X profile board, right? And that's uh, uh, running um, the system at the moment. If it had the widget in there, you'd know it because they're extremely noisy, right? <laughs> and they make a lot of noise. Same, same with the profile. I can also show you just how easy it is to service these things. It's really easy. Uh, you just undo the back there and the whole thing slides out in a cage. So you might like to see that, but I can sort of take it out, it's very easy to do. Um, and you can see uh, just you know, what the internal arrangement is. Must be the last user serviceable app in three months. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is quite serviceable. As I said, I had these three, and I did manage to uh, you know, cobble together two working units. They all needed a bit of work, uh, all the, the drives were seized up, and, uh, uh, but certainly they could be done, even by someone like me. So you're quite right, you know, they are, they are serviceable uh, machines. The, the keyboard's interesting, uh, it's got these little tags here uh, that pop out, and they, um, they show you how to use, essentially, the office suite. You know, it's like shortcuts uh, that you can look at. I had to do some work on the keyboard because these keyboards, um, they use those foam pads, right? <laughs> and if any of you ever got an old <laughs> keyboard that's never been in service, you'll find they actually rot. Uh, so I got some replacement pads from the States and very uh, laboratory uh, just replaced uh, each one. Uh, the mouse there is not a genuine uh, Lisa mouse, that's a mouse from a, uh, uh, an Apple Mac Plus, which uh, is compatible. So, what else can I say about it? Um, Oh, one of the other differences between the, uh, the Lisa 2.5 and this Lisa 2.10 uh, is the ports on the back are slightly different. Uh, there's four cards inside, uh, two memory cards, an I.O. card and a CPU card. Um, the only difference between the Lisa 2.5 and the Lisa 2.10 is the input-output card is different. And the ports on the back, uh, I think it's got one less parallel port on the back on this one. Uh, whereas the Lisa 2.5 had two parallel ports on the 
there, and one of them, of course, was used for the propyl drill. And also the Mac Excel story? Oh, the Mac Excel story, yeah. <laughs> so these lasted about three years in the marketplace, which wasn't very long, okay? Once the Macintosh came out, uh, they fell away. And uh, so they brought out the Lisa 210 with the office suite. But by then the Mac was uh, uh, full steam ahead. It was starting to, uh, to become uh, quite popular within its niche market. And uh, they dropped the price of these. I think they halved the price. And rather than bundling it with the Lisa office suite, they put a version of um, the Mac software on here. And they call them the Macintosh XL. Right? So instead of the Lisa 210, when bundled with the Macintosh suite, it was the Macintosh XL. And I think they also tweaked, they might have tweaked the video board yeah, as so well. I think something unusual yeah. about these is they have rectangular pixels. And yeah. when, it, when you got the Mac version, they changed the video. They did. And I think, I think you actually, pixels. if you were converging, you got a kit which <laughs> enabled you to sort of alter the video card. It was already done for you. Yeah, the display resolution is slightly different, so it had to be tweaked. So they were sold uh, for a while as the Mac Macintosh XL, just at the very end of their life. Apparently they sold more Mac XLs than any other Lisa. But. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's, um, you know, as I said, it's very innovative at the time. Uh, if you use it now, you'll see that it's, um, one of the problems is that it's very, very expensive. And it's quite slow, you know, it, uh, it takes a, a while to, uh, to do things. Yeah, but it was that sort of speed and expense, really, that uh, means it didn't go anywhere. But certainly, you know, it was the prototype for the Macintosh, and as I say, the first, you know, you know really widely available graphics uh, um, user interface. Thank you. Thank you. The power supply for the Oryx is both, so unfortunately I can't show you those going. Um, and the Memotech 5 NTX 512 there, it works but only for a little while. But behind it there is my recently acquired um, re Memotech, which is a uh, Altera D1 port. And uh, the guy who wrote that program there, Hextrain, he um, also created that board. Well, not the actual board, but the Rememotech um, software for it. So it emulates a um, Memotech NTX 512 app for just over 4 megahertz, the original score, but you can also um, run it up to 25 megahertz. And um, yeah, that's about it. Michael, uh, how, how um how popular were these Memotechs? Are they the Memo sold Techs, here or are they mainly sold in the UK? Or? They were mainly sold in the UK. Um, a bit like the Dragon. They were built in the UK, but they didn't take off. A bit of a TRS-80 specialist. There's only a handful of machines and uh, this is one of them. So the Tandy Radio Shack. Um, came out with a Model 1 in 1977, along with, as you probably most of you know, the Apple II and the Commodore PET. And uh, as these big corporates are sort of inclined to uh, sort of rest on their laurels, they didn't sort of, well, they were so overcome by the success of the Model 1 that, um, yeah, products didn't develop that quickly. But um, they had Model 2, which is a big business machine, which is rather rare, and then you had Model 3 and the 4, and this is the Model 4. Um, as we didn't really have Radio Shack proper authorised, well we had authorised outfits in New Zealand but not proper Radio Shack stores. So, and they were so expensive in the day, so yeah, people like Dick Smith came along with their um, clones and, and uh, workalikes. And so we had a lot of, you know, Dick Smith system agents in New Zealand, which went to a lot of stores. But over in the States, these were everywhere, like you had, you know, Radio Shack stores, there was over 3,000 shops in the States alone, so every corner, you know. In the town, eventually get one. So the schools are full of these things. So um, this came out in 1983, and uh, you can see which one is aged better, the Steve Jobs or the 
radio shack. <laughs> this one has been painted at all, like they must have put plastic and all, because that's just how, how it was when I received it. I've had it about 10 years and I found this one on a trade in New Zealand. So I know this thing here is a modern um, hard drive emulator, so it's an SD card, which you know, is great for two ways. It gives us lots of storage for hard drive, plus it gives you an avenue for um, bringing in software from the internet. Um, what else is there about it? That's about it. And yeah. it's actually this, yeah, so the Model 4 was the last of the Z80 sort of line for Tandy Radio Shack. So this will emulate the Model 3, which in turn pretty much emulates the Model 1. And this can also do CPM. So really, this is sort of the, the Rolls Royce of the Z80 line, and you can run pretty much any of the Z80 Radio Shack software for some reason. Um, and then Tandy went on to do um, like the Tandy 1000, see PC, see clones and things. Um, so yeah, they were around for quite a while. Um, so is this a CPM in 80 times or 64 times? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I can put up CPM later on. Yeah, no, it does 80. So this, <laughs> this wall here will emulate, yeah, 64 column for the Model 3 mode, which is very faithful, you know, it's full hardware Model 3, so it will run any Model 3 software. And then you've got Model 4, which is 80 column by 24 by 12, and then CPM video. as well. We swap out some video and swap out some ROMs. Yep, yeah. yep. It's got the Model 3 ROM in it, and um, mm. yeah, it can swap in that, or can use Model 4 or CPM. So well, essentially, it's three machines in one. Yeah. It's a CPM machine, it's a Model 4, and it's a Model 3. They're what, not too well, they're pretty successful in the States. And Model 3 was really good. I mean, CPM by then was stuck to, you know, Wayne a bit, um, but uh, what can I say? yeah, so um, yeah, that, we we're sort of at the end of their line, and uh, I don't know if they sold really huge numbers. Certainly, the Model 3 was more successful, particularly with schools and things, yeah. Because as you see, in 83, you know, things are moving on a fair bit, so um, hmm. yeah, certainly PCs would start to crank up. I started life on uh, my first computer was my granddad's EC30, um, and I really loved that. And then uh, for my seven, when I was seven, uh, we had Christmas at home. Uh, Dad brought home an Amiga, and I remember seeing the Flight Path 737 intro screen, and that was it. I was blown away. Uh, the rest of the game, uh, not so great, but that intro screen uh, really hooked me. So, um, but yeah, I brought along today an Amiga 1200. It's got a um, 68030 accelerator at 50 megahertz, 128 megs of RAM. Um, it's got compact flash, 4 SD card. I bought both uh, hard drive options with all the games. So if anyone wants to come and play a game later on that they may have played as a kid, it, I, I more than likely have it on here. You guys can try it out. Um, I've also bought a couple of um, O6 accelerators. If anyone wants to just have a look at them, they're quite hard to get hold of these days. I don't know if anyone wants to just see if they want to go. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't really have too much else to say. Uh, as I say, I'm not an expert on this stuff. I just love it. Um, I've got a bit of a collection at home with just about every model except the towers. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Sorry for the, the small intro. Yeah, really, story. Can you just explain what the console is there for the joysticks? Right, so this is a Battle Station 2. So, this actually will um, support a number of different computers. It's got different switches and um, ports on the back, depending on what you have Atari, Commodore, um, what have you. Um, and it basically allows you to have two players um, by just running a serial port extension to the um, joystick port, mouse port. Um, and it's really great for fighting games and things like that. Um, again, quite hard to find. I was lucky to be prowling around on trade me years ago before. People were all over it, you could get stuff at yeah, quite, quite good prices. So, which Amiga do you use most of the time? 1200. Yeah, just because it's, um, I use it with like a modern power supply and a modern accelerator, I can run it all day without having to worry about you know, overheating or breaking down. Um, yeah. I use an Amiga 2000 for doing X copy and copying games mm. and oh. stuff, and then um, yeah, 4000 and stuff is more just to look at. So, did you ever lose faith with the Amiga and move to the PC for a while, or did you uh, always stay with the Amiga? I did, I did. Um, actually, we ended up getting a PC when I started, I think it was Intermedia, and it had Doom and everything like that on it. I've actually got Doom, well, I'll show you guys later this one with Doom as well. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, once that came out, um, 486s and stuff, the Amiga, it still stayed there, but it was kind of off to the side. Um, I think I remember the last games I was playing with the pinball games, because they, for me, were the ones that were kind of keeping up with 
the graphics of the four exits at the time. Um, <laughs> today what I bought was the idea of TCJX, just because it's a machine that you haven't seen a lot of. These um, originally came out in Japan around 1984, which is a little bit late. Um, they were intended for to be a 16-bit computer for the hard back then, an 8-bit MSX was the standard, so they thought they might have a chance for 16-bit, and also for small businesses. They failed pretty badly, and this meant that by 1985 there was a lot of excess stock that they had to give to somebody, and New Zealand and Australia would met somebody. So this is the English converted IBM GX. Uh, originally, 720 by 512 color graphics, but the New Zealand and Australian models held that pulled down. But yeah, this has got the expansion unit on it, 360 day floppy as well, so you got three floppy drives. Uh, I've got it running Planet X3 at the moment. You get the professional-ish, um, so you get an enhanced keyboard layout, which is completely wireless, which is kind of nice. And these were almost half the price of an IBM PC at the time. So it wasn't a bad The interesting thing was that these are 720 day floppy drives, but to not compete with the IBM PC or the PC XT, IBM specifically modified the BIOS to double step the floppy drive, limiting capacity to 360 kilobyte, and it means you can't use the 720 k formatted to sketch in this machine. Um, by about 1986, the IBM PC and PC XT were allowed 720 k floppies, so they offered a rock upgrade for this machine to fix the floppy drive. It's kind of funny. <laughs> and in, in Japan, they were 720 k the whole time. They were really 720, so it was a definite move by IBM. Um, also in Japan, it was available in 8 or 7 megabits, which is kind of nice. Um, so there weren't a lot made. Um, from memory, the serial number of this expansion unit is like number 17 or 19. Um, this base model, I think, is 394. But I'd say there was probably about 10,000 sold in Australia and New Zealand. That's my guess. Tell them about the Christmas presents. Was it, oh, yeah, that was pretty funny. So IBM Japan is celebrating an anniversary, and this is towards the end of the JX's lifespan. They said they offered every one of their employees a complete IBM PC JX system. They didn't have quite enough IBM GXs, so they also offered the commemorative cups. And they ran out of the cups on the GXs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They weren't terribly popular in Japan because of their pricing. And obviously, the games on MSX are going to be a lot more fun than any of the game Here's my family of pets. <laughs> There's a spare space here for the next one. This was my first exposure to a computer that I'd ever seen. It was long Sorry ago, that. my brother bought it. Um, so this is one of the ones that um, Commodore and their wisdom decided that have a 16K computer that was upgradable to uh, 32K, but they didn't want people doing it themselves. So they drilled out the, the PCBs where the RAM slots are. So there's four holes in the PCB with a, for the RAM. So in this case, my brother bought a 16K expansion board, which when I tried it fast didn't work. There's some corrosion on it. So that was a few hundred dollars extra. <laughs> and that sort of just sits on top of the board with some brackets and it's just rather ugly. Um, like all the pets, these ones have the, the bonnet that opens up. Um, this one and that one does, except they change it on that one and the rear opens up, which is just a little bit um, slightly more annoying as it tries to internals of it. Um, so that's that one. Um, there's an 80 column one with 32k of RAM, and there's another um, 80 column. With 32K, it's got the same circuit board on that. It's got a 64K expansion, which you can't actually operate without putting the software on there. The um, last one, too, there's something to do with ports with it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, there's a port design case. Right, so yes, I'm Alistair. Um, I'm his youngest brother. I'm not the one he was talking about who bought the original pet. Okay, that one there um, is the Dream 6800, which is what I bought uh, second hand, 1982. Now, it's an Electronics Australia kit set from 1979. Um, the Motorola 6800 IC is what it's using, um, with 1K of memory, 1K of ROM. 
and that's what you learn to do, you start with. So that was my first computer. I probably sold it three times and then got it back. Oh, and when I first got it, the cassette interface didn't work, so you had to type every program out every time. <laughs> I soon fixed that. Along here, um, we've got the same Motorola um, processors. This is a 6800 trainer that you would have found at university. Um, I never really plugged this in, so I don't know if it goes. This is also a Motorola-based computer. Um, this is not going, but it was just like one day I'll get around to it. Um, this is more of an industrial setup. So you had like eight expansion slots, and depending on what you wanted to do, you could do it. Now, this here is the later version, being the 6809. So it had a reputable um, name in America, you know, Sweet PC 6809. It's still an 8 bit computer, but it's got 16 bit architecture. Um, each card, like this, it's got a couple of a few in there. Um, is maximum of 64k. With memory banking, you can get up to 2 meg. Right, along the back, you've got the SS50 um, interface, so there was all sorts of things you could buy for it. Um, there was one of these machines running the entire Tasman pulp and paper mill in the middle of the little North Island, um, and they basically just had one terminal, and the rest of it was IO lines. Now, it's the first machine I knew of that would do um, networking. It would run 16 terminals, 16 dumb terminals, um, and it was capable of a um, either floppy, either 8 inch, 5 inch, or a hard drive, but never got, I never went that way. Um, so that's where I come from, and that was all. I run the uh, Monotech PCs business. You may have seen some things on Facebook or Facebook. Um, I mainly make packs for IBM PCs and things like that. Like, this thing <coughs> here is a IBM 5155, which is IBM's response to the Compact Portable, I believe. I can't remember the exact year, but I think it was either 83 or 84. Uh, it would have had to have been 83 at least because it contains a regular XT motherboard. Unlike the compact, which is all custom parts, this just has an XT motherboard. So the keyboard just goes by an extension, plugs in the back. Sort of. It's quite funny the way it's tracked. Yeah, um, that's got some, some old 30 meg hard drive in there. I'm not sure if it was the original one, but it sounds like. Uh, uh, so I probably did upgrade it. 30 meg seems pretty big for the time. But, um, yeah, right now that one's fitted out set to a six accelerator and EGA and stuff like that. But um, this IBM technical reference doesn't go with it, it's just uh, for bringing it along for school. It's the first edition one for the 5150, so it doesn't even mention the uh, double sided fluffy drives in it. Because when the 5150 came out, it just had single sided fluffies for a very short time. So if you find one single sided fluffies inside, it's uh, quite a rare beast. Yeah. yeah, otherwise uh, I've got a bunch of prototype or products that I may release later. Um, these ones here I've been doing recently, they should come out soon because they're working in everything I've tried so far. It's uh, replacements for the weird MOS CPUs such as the one in the Z64, like the 6510 or the 8501 in the Z16 or Plus 4. Um, it just uses a regular 6502 on it, which is what they are internally, those weird chips. It's just a 6502 with some extra functions. And the 6502 you can get um, from China for two bucks, and most of the time you don't even get a fax. So. Um, whereas the 6510, you have to get a MOS one, they're the only one who made them, and they're usually 40 bucks plus on eBay and stuff like that. So, um, and more importantly, the 8501 and stuff, because those die all the time, and they're, um, yeah, very uncommon. So that's, um, it will basically come as a it will come as a blank board with the surface mount parts on, and you solder the headers in a different spot and the solder jumpers depending on which of the four CPUs you want it to be. Otherwise, we have a uh, C64 replacement power brick. So you know, you know how, how bad the originals are. Mm -hmm. um, this 
<laughs> pro probably won't be a product I'll release, it will be more of a, maybe a DIY kit, um, open source thing people can build. Um, that is, uh, you know, the GoTek floppy emulator, that's like a, a kitted out custom one that's got all the different weird floppy connectors, so um, things like synthesizers and, uh, for example, it can plug straight into the Osborne one, which just has power and power and floppy on one. And it's got the, the larger screen, which you can't actually mod into a regular go uh, That there is what, one of my main products. It's just a XT motherboard, but in an ATX style form factor. It takes ATX power supply. It's regular, or slightly older connections, but not as old as you would find with an XT. Like, in fact, it reports two keyboards, it's a comeback flash slot. But um, yeah, these will, uh, this new batch, I should probably be releasing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a, got a new look to it. I've, I've, I've sold these for a couple of years. But, um, the last one's green, this one's brown. So what's the equivalent to it? Like, does it have more graphics? Um, it has a PC-104 slot, you know, like the, um, the industrial sort of industrial computers use these. It's stackable. Uh -huh. That's just like an ISO bus on there. Um, they, it can come optionally with this VGA PC104 card and it just routes to there, or you can not get that and put a nicer card in. It's so equivalent to a 10 megahertz XT, so it's got an 8088 on it. Okay. Um, you can switch it down to 4.7. So VGA XT? Yep. Um, the, the card is more, more 90s oriented, um, but it's all about what the chips I can get, and I've managed to be able to get those, and they work great on the 8088. So. Cool. So I brought this last time, it's just a straight MSX machine um, with a compact flash SD card reader in it. So people aren't familiar with an MSX, it's a Z80 machine from 1983. It was manufactured by 25, 30 different companies around the world, mostly in Japan. This one's Panasonic. Um, it's, a, it's a nice 8-bit um, computer, uh, lots of homebrews going on. Um, there's an annual competition called MSX Dev. Um, I'm, I've got a work in progress which I can demonstrate of uh, what I'm going to enter into MSX Dev 22. Um, so uh, we need a guinea pig to, to work with doing things. Come on, come here. <laughs> So, so this is a, a based on a 1978 arcade game called Blasto, which I bought has always been with me. Um, this is called Blastoid, and a Blastoid is an extinct form of a kind of doom, so it's a bad pun. Um, and you're a tank, and you go around um, the squares just get your weight and you can shoot them with the with the fire button. And I, and if you shoot the kind of things <laughs> close up, then you then you spin around and go back to the starting spot. Don't shoot that. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea is you've got to beat the clock to clear all of the uh, blastoid, the kind of things, and the starfish. Um, and you get an extra ten seconds if you shoot the um, if you shoot the stand timer. If you run into the little whirlpool, you spin around and. Again. Um, and um, there's, there's two different games, each has eight levels, and they're both against the clock. Um, I haven't got sound, I haven't put the sound in it yet, uh, and I have to do the level design a little bit better because at the moment everything defaults to 100 seconds. Um, I wrote it in SDCC, so a small device C compiler, so a modern cross compiler. Um, and it's pretty easy, and, you know, I'm just using Notepad++, type it up, press uh, make, throw it into a debugger, and, oh, not debugger, throw it into the OpenMSX emulator, and from coding to trying it out, it's just seconds, and then I can throw it onto the compact flash, uh, not compact flash, the SD card, um, and load it up. So I brought a long couple of um, homebrews as well from the last couple of years. I would have brought some more, but 
I've got digital downloads of them um, and I've whacked them onto here. So there's lots of games to play if anyone wants to have a bit of a play. Well done. Um, I have a, I'm a System 80 kid back in the day and a 48k Spectrum kid back in the day. But these things are easier to transport and require less maintenance. <laughs> my actual rail Spectrum to pieces. Uh, trying to get refurbished at the moment. It'll take a while. So here we've got the Spectrum Next. This is started up by crew out of the UK. I think it's kind of a multinational crew basically. They did a Kickstarter where they wanted to basically reimagine the Spectrum as a as if it was a modern computer, basically. Um, as we all know, the Spectrum is the king of the 80s games machine. Um, but what they did was add some things that were missing, like uh, sprites and sound chips. And really, it's kind of intended to be the evolution of where the 128 Spectrum left off. Um, I think it was Roger Dickinson was the original case designer of the Spectrum. He actually designed the case for this thing. Um, and they put a lot of the effort into it, giving it a really nice keyboard, which it does have. But if we, if we go under the hood, when it boots up, it has kind of a, a actually it's got extensive help built into it. It has a monitor. Uh, it's got an SD card in there that's full of stuff. Um, it'll actually run CPM as well, if I wanted to. But yeah, we go straight to the good bits and just find a. Um, so I want to find, I want to find this one, see if it starts. You basically load games in it. Even just a memory snapshot or an emulator tape loading there. Um, has, they, they wrote a, a, a new basic for it as well, so it has a really, really capable version of basic in it. Um, and they enhanced the graphics mode. There are half a dozen new graphics modes for it. It has sprites, it has lots of colors, it has megabytes of RAM in it. But when you use it, you can kind of choose how far you want to go down that road. You can just use it like a 48K, literally run a 48K. Or, or more, more than 128k with a, with a little bit better basic where you're typing in your instructions instead of using your shortcuts. Or you can use Next Basic, which is basically really fast enough to not have to go to assembly. Right? You can write a capable game because of the sprite and because of the language constructs. But basically, an arcade style game in basic, which is pretty crazy. Wow, what have I done there? Oh, oh, as you can see, I don't spend a lot of time with it either. But what it's got here is, is because it's an FPGA inside, it, it can emulate a whole bunch of other things. So I won't do this now, but you can basically put a personality on top of it that will be equivalent to any Spectrum style hardware machine. Uh, so I can make it like a ZX81 or a ZX80. <laughs> I don't know if it does an ORIC, but it might, it might do that. Or the American Timex ones. I'm going to go there now. I'll just skip that. Go to my browser. Let's find something else. Uh, let's run that. Um, they started a second Kickstarter to do a kind of a, a second rev of it. They, they had a few issues. They didn't have a power supply. Either, and there were some things about a bit of um, kind of electrical noise in it. So they've done rejected it. PC board layout. Um, are those Camston joystick ports on the front? Are. They didn't do all of them. Basically, you can switch it. No. So there's the, the Sinclair one, which nobody didn't use anyway, Camston. Yeah. Are they DB9s? Yeah. DB9s, yeah. yeah. So there's yeah. Atari joystick in there. And it's also got a bunch of stuff that used to be able to get a kind of expansion units for the Spectrum that would do stuff like it'd have a button that would just freeze the CPU and you could dump the whole memory to tape. So make a backup of the game. As long as it didn't fall off whilst you're in the middle of the uh, game. But so it has an NMI there that you can kind of get into a monitor for so oh. Yeah, nice machine. It's lovely. And this keyboard is I mean that they, they, they agonized over this keyboard and it delayed it by months. But it's beautiful. It's really worth the wait. Thank you. Yeah, like it's, you come out and have a have a play with it if you want. It's, it's amazing. It's gone down a lot better than the Atari VCS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is created by a guy called Spencer out of the UK, Nottingham in the UK. He entered a competition in 2014 to basically develop a, a, a microcomputer or this an electronics project. And he came up with a um, basically a, a simple 8 bit machine. Right? And he, he was a Spectrum guy as well, but he's really inspired by the, the UK engineering culture. 
and also Singapore computers or S100 computers. So the idea of the RC2014 is it's, a, it's just a, basically a ZAD backplane, right? And then each part of the computers are uh, provided on a separate card. Um, so we've got a CPU, we've got some ROM, we've got some RAM. We've got a, a serial port which uses Z80 as a kind of companion chip for doing serial input. It has two IOs on it. Uh, and an SD card, which basically emulates a hard drive. Um, as well as that, I have a, an IO chip, so this just gives us inputs and outputs. You know, we've got some LEDs and some buttons that live on a, a port of the Z80. Um, and the original version of this just ran basic. So this is the first edition you put out. And you can see it's actually got a, a little jiggy on it so it could run CPM because uh, this back plane has a couple less um, uh, lines on it. Right? This bigger back plane has more lines and we don't need the, the little hack there. But as well, there's a card here called a BT132 that is very temperamental. So th this thing basically connects into the serial port on the, on the Z80 but provides uh, the VGA IO. And as well as that, it has a Wi-Fi uh, built into the module there. So what you can do with this is uh, basically skip the computer and just use its, its terminal. Um, so you can use the modem directly. You can set up the Wi-Fi and then connect to a Telnet BBS. Right? So there's a whole world of Telnet BBSs that will run full ANSI graphics style BBSs, which is extreme deep nerdishness. Built this thing. It emulates pretty much every terminal out there. You know, full ANSI, da 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 da, plus, plus the modem. Um, but also it provides the IO for the RC2014. If you don't have this, you're going to have a serial cable going to your PC. So this is kind of a bit more fun, real experience. One thing I would really like to do for this, and I, I don't want to do it really, but is get an older machine, cannibalize the keyboard, and give it a real ASCII keyboard. So it actually feels like a real one, because this is, this is cheap seats. Um, I should show you Zorg, but I'll have a look at that later. Everyone's seen Zorg. Any questions about this one? Thanks, Thanks, great. Thank you. Yeah, so I kind of brought along the Atari 8, well, many members of the Atari 8 family. Um, I guess the one I would really like to get is the, obviously, the Atari 400, just because it's so cool. Um, I guess it starts off only last year, actually, so my experience isn't really even kind of Atari computers. Um, no one I knew in the UK ever had one. It's all Commodore 64 and Spectrums and Acorn Electrons and BBCs from school. Um, but just last year, I kind of so I realized how wonderful the Atari 800 looked, and I thought I'd get one. I actually imported this one from the USA. Um, just love the look of it, though. It's incredibly robust. It's kind of got um, a metal cage inside, a sort of metal shielding. Um, at the time, you know, the American regulations were really strict about um, RF interference, so that's why it costs a lot of money time to build and buy. Uh, this is like 1979, so it's just after that kind of try. And then it's kind of early, you know, the Apple's 2, so Tandy and uh, what's the other one. Um, and then, you know, Atari, obviously, they spun this out for many, many years, all the way up to the, the ultimate, the, 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 the one, final one, the 130XE. Um, not really, I guess, true, I'm sorry, because it's kind of owned by Tremil. Uh, not really genuine Atari at that point, but that's, um, this is the, this one actually doesn't work. Um, um, this is the um, 128K version, kind of with the new Atari SD styling of the time. Those kind of diagonal keys. Um, this one I got recently, Atari 800XL. In the box and stuff. Um, so this is very recent. I um, only tested this a few days ago. Uh, but you know, it's a huge difference between you know the, the, the machines, even though they're all architecturally the same. Um, and then there's the kind of game console version that he did. This piece of computer manufacturer at the time also tried their computer uh, their game console versions, like the Commodore 64 game, but you know, console version. This is actually pretty cool, actually, with a separate keyboard. But like, you know, you've got three generations, mate. you've got the original 400 and 800, um, the 400 with the kind of member, uh, the kind of ZX81 style keyboard, that looked awesome. And then you've got like the XL, and you have um, three XLs that are really juiced, so the 1200 XL was the first one, 
um, massively overpriced. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but beautiful, actually beautiful, actually one of the most beautiful computers there is. Um, kind of certainly the same kind of style, but a bit further out. Um, would like to get one. Um, then they introduced the cost reduced version, which is the 600 XL and the 800 XL, and the difference is the memory. So 64 kilobytes versus the 16 kilobytes, I think, of the 600 XL. And the keyboard again is nice, you know, it's nice to use, you know, it's quite fun. Um, so I would like to kind of type that. And then you kind of got the even more cost reduced version, so the 130XE and the XEGS. And there's another one as well, again, with um, 64K in memory, which is um, suitable for model numbers depending on where it is sold in the world. Um, same sort of looks the same as that kind of. So you kind of sold this and you know, they're just trying to get money, really support the rest of the business and trying to eke out as much they could from it. Yeah, well, that was sold in two grips. That was sold with and without the keyboard. Oh. So you could buy it just as a console or as a <laughs> thing with a, with a keyboard. With a lot, with a lot. The only thing I'm missing from it is the light gun. It came in a kind of huge box. It kind of comes in, but the light gun's missing, which is kind of shame. But I really haven't got really much to test, to show to test with it, unfortunately. It's just a few cartridges. Um, so I would like to kind of get the FujiNet. That'd be the one thing I'd really like to get to try with the computer, um, which is like plugs into the SIO port, and emulates, you know, allows you to go online, emulates disk drives and all sorts of stuff. So it's really kind of very flexible thing. Um, yeah, the, this is, has an AC pass plane instead of DC, which is, you know, yeah. which I think online state is way, way more reliable. So it's not going to be much that can go wrong, but I'm not with DCs. Um, and the same power supply will work with the disk drive as this. Um, so, I guess at some point I will try and turn this on. Um, and then the other thing that I just bought was the advanced home computer course. Because I guess. No, I've got six of those. Yeah, I, I, got, um, I got these in New Zealand. I've got actually two sets in the UK, um, just from boot sales. And my, well, the first set's my brother's one when he actually used to collect it. Yeah. He's got the original, you know, um, and I've got set of boot sales next to nothing. But I used to really love reading them, um, which is really sad. <laughs> um, so with that, you know, before I even kind of really kind of bought computers, um, used to just kind of read about them, really. Um, and it's, you know, it's really interesting. It's, you know, you've seen a lot of, you know, some of these computers here being talked about and in depth guides. And also got like a, like a catalogue from the time, you know, 1983, you know. If you want to you know, work out which PC to buy, or the time to buy, you know. You can see the UK cable? Yes, it starts off with like, you know, Acorn Atom, the Atari 400, 150 pounds. If anyone just sort of looks through any of these and just want to read through today, this is a book someone recommended on Facebook. Um, 100 icons to find the computers. And so, this is quite a beautiful book and really beautiful photos, a little bit about each one. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So, I'd recommend that book to anyone. It's pretty cool. It's about 40 um, bucks. Did you get it on Amazon? You get it on Book Depository. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Kirk. Um, I just wanted to bring something light because we're going away for the weekend. Um, and uh, I think last time I mentioned the Advent of Computing podcast, which is a very expensive podcast to listen to. Um, because uh, when I listened to the episode about the Vectrix, I was like, oh, Vector Graphics from 1982, that sounds kind of cool. <laughs> um, and the shipping ended up being very eye watering. But um, so I don't know a lot about this, but Evans bought his games, so um, uh, I've ordered a multi-cart, but it hasn't arrived yet. The deal with these was um, they uh, they wanted to make an arcade-style home computer, um, and rather than using pixels on the screen, um, they use the uh, CRT. You know, basically just turn the beam on, draw a line, turn the beam off to do vector graphics. Um, so it's quite unusual for the time and that it has quite good graphics. Um, so yeah, we can try a bunch of Evans games if he's cool with that. Yeah, um, that's the overlays in my order. Oh yeah, and that's right. Do you want to talk about that? Or do you want me to show yeah. you? You do it. 
Yeah, so it's black and white, obviously, um, and one of the cool features was that each game would come with a colour transparency that you can click on. Oh, that's so oh. cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's colour. It's colour. Static, but it's colour. Done. Yeah, so they, they just clip in the front. You put it front on screen. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That's the, 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 reason, right. the reason why they flicker is because of the way they, they the, use the, the phosphor lines. to actually hold some of the, right. the, the display a little bit. So yeah. the, um, between refreshes, you, you do get a bit of... Um, so yeah, obviously, probably aware of some Apple II GS. Um, I'm a real big Apple II fan, have been for years. Um, I grew up sort of with Apple IIEs mostly. Um, my dad was actually a high school computer science teacher, he's retired now, and the school had a big a lab full of Apple IIEs. We didn't actually own one, but we would bring one home at the weekend. I'd play pirate games on. We didn't have any original games. I have a stack of original games now, but they just you just didn't see them in New Zealand at all. Um, so obviously, yeah, this is a 16-bit machine, the original Apple II, and so eight bit. So this does run all the um, Apple II software as well. Uh, what I've actually got on at the moment is something called Total Replay, which is a, it's a hard drive image, which basically has um, you can sort of his lap. So how was it? Um, yeah, so you can just uh, sort of scan through um, and like um, load games from from here. And if you leave it like I had before, it has kind of a track mode where it has um, yeah stills from the games and also scans of the cover art and that sort of thing. And ultra high res, which is the hot like uh, super high res, which is you know the higher resolution uh, mode on the two GS. I sort of done a few things to it, but as you see, obviously the no disk drive because I'm using a the Comic Flash. S USB CFFA 2000, so it's Compact Flash for Apple. Um, it's I've got the, yeah, the Comic Flash in, on the actually attached in the inside of the USB attached to this, so, it's, so it sort of flashes well, just sort of light on top, so it kind of flashes when there's uh, disk activity. Um, also, um, so it emulates both hard drive and floppy drives, um, and I've got this sort of little wood bubble here which you can sort of swap floppy disks on the fly. So if you press it, you know it flashes the number of times for. You know, so I've got four floppy drives set now, so you can flash you know, three times to the third one, four times to the fourth one, and then if you go back to the first one, it flashes once. So there's two floppy drives there. For the yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say, uh, the other sort of things I've added to it, it was, it, it, the 2GS originally actually had uh, stereo sound support, but um, I think, well, it was, you know, one of the, it was also slowed down, which I think was because Steve Jobs Wanted to the, didn't want to compete with Macintosh, so yeah, it was actually only 12.8 megahertz, which is pretty slow. Um, but it also had stereo support, but you couldn't actually get stereo unless you bought a third-party card to lay out with the stereo, which is what I've done here, which is not an original one from the 80s, but it's a whole you know one, so it's a more recent one. Uh, the only thing I'm sort of really missing is an accelerator card, uh, but they go for sort of 500 yeah. or more on eBay, and I have not been able to afford one yet. Um, I hopefully get one at some point, but yeah, it's um, it, yeah. Well, that was one of the kind of issues with it at the time. It was quite slow compared to things like the Amiga, so it didn't quite take off, which I think was somewhat by design of Steve Jobs because he wanted the Mac to be successful rather than the Apple II. So this was the kind of not quite the end of the Apple II line. There was the Apple II C Plus after this, which was actually an eight-bit machine that had four megahertz, so it was actually faster than this, and um, it didn't run the uh, more advanced 2GS software and the I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Apple IIe cards that came out in the 90s, which was, you could put into, I think, like a various Macs, including Mac LC, and sort of basically was a, you know, not really even an emulator, it was like literally like the whole hardware of Apple IIe on the chip, and you can run the original disk drives and joysticks and things such as that. Yes. Funnily enough, this particular, this 2GS I have here, I've had it for about 15 years. Um, I got it on Trade Me, um, and it was, a, it was a pickup in this area in Raleigh, actually, uh, and it cost me $26. <laughs> Thanks very much for watching this video. I'm sure you can agree that there was some fantastic machines on hand. If you do want to subscribe to this channel, please do so. But if you join us and become a member on YouTube, 
or on Patreon, then you get access to some exclusive content. I'm showing you a few snippets of the bonus material which is in this particular video, which shows you all the innards here of the Lisa, shows you how it works. I've got some Sinclair stuff as well that you don't see in the in this the shortened version of the video. So it's a fantastic way to see all the latest and greatest of my content. So if you want to join in, join in with the club here on YouTube by pressing on that join button, or you can join in with Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab. Until then next time, thanks very much for watching and I'll see you soon.